Hello everyone and welcome to our today's class. It is our first lesson on the topic magnetic effect of an electric current. So as usual, let me commence by giving you the quote of the day which states that life is like riding a bicycle such that for you to stay balanced, you must keep moving. So we'll discuss that quote at the end of our class today. So today we are looking at a magnetic effect of an electric current, but we have a professor of physics who was called Hans Osten, actually is the professor who discovered a magnetic effect of an electric current. So he did discover that actually a conductor carrying current has a magnetic field around it. Although we had various scientists who contributed to that discovery, for example, we have a scientist called Michael Faraday, uh, who actually came up with the Faraday's law. Uh, we'll look at the Faraday's law in a certain topic in Form 4 called uh, electromagnetic induction. So uh, to demonstrate his discovery, he carried out an experiment. So this is the exper experiment that was carried out by Hans Osten, that is in the year uh, 1820. So the experiment is to investigate the magnetic effect of, an, of a current flowing through a conductor. So the apparatus required are one direct current power source. This is our direct current power source. Then uh, we also need connecting wires. These are our connecting wires. Then of course we also need a switch. This is our switch. Then uh, a rheostat or sometimes we call it a variable resistor. Then uh, we also have two magnetic compasses. So you have this our first magnetic compass then our second magnetic compass. Then of course you also need an ammeter for recording the amount of current flowing through the circuit. So the procedure that he followed was one, you set up the apparatus as shown in this diagram then you hold the wire over but in line with the compass needle A. So you take the wire this wire should pass uh, hold the wire over but in line with the compass needle A and in line but below compass needle B. So you pass this wire in such a way that it is passing over or above compass needle A then such that it is passing below the compass needle B. Then after that you close the switch that is uh, you close this particular switch uh, and observe the compass needles. Then you vary the strength of the current using, of course, the rheostat or the variable resistor and note the effect of the needle. That is, observe the deflection of the needle. Then, after that, you repeat the experiment with the battery polarities reversed. Huh? You now reverse the positive terminal. You reverse the connection of the positive terminal and the negative terminal. Remember, whenever you reverse the polarities of the battery, that means the, the direction of current of flow uh, will also be reversed. Now, to predict the direction in which the needle A and B or the compass needles A and B will deflect, he needed what we call the Ampere's swimming rule. So the Ampere's swimming rule states that if one imagines one is swimming along a wire in the direction of the current and facing the compass needle, then the north pole of the needle will be deflected towards the swimmer's left hand. That if you imagine that you're actually swimming along the direction of the current. So if this is the positive terminal, then it means the current will always flow in this direction. Remember the larger bar always, always represents the positive terminal, while the smaller bar represents the negative terminal of the battery or of the cell. Now, if this is the larger bar, then it means the current is flowing in this particular direction. So the Ampere swimming rule is... Uh, are requiring us to imagine that a person is swimming along this uh, in the direction of the current and along this wire. Then uh, that if such a person is moving in the direction of the current that is and facing the compass needle then the north pole of the needle will be deflected towards the swimmer's left hand. Now imagine you are, you, you are the person swimming along this wire in this direction of the current. Then when you reach here, automatically this your right hand will be on the lower side while the left hand will be on the upper side. So the Ampere swimming rule predicts that this particular needle will deflect on the side of, the, of your left hand or of the left hand of the swimmer. Therefore, I expect needle A to deflect upwards. 
Remember for needle A, the wire was passing above it. Huh? But if you connect it in such a way that the wire is passing below, now the needle B, now the direction of deflection of the needle actually reverses. So if this one deflected upwards, then automatically for B, the needle would deflect downwards. Now, he also tried the experiment after reversing the polarities. That is, if we connected these uh, cables or the, the, the battery in such a way that the positive terminal becomes on this other side, then the negative terminal on the other side, then if the positive terminal was here, it means the current will now be flowing in this particular direction. So if you imagine that you are the swimmer, if you are swimming in this particular direction, that is along the direction of the current, then when you reach here, actually your, your right hand will be upwards and your left hand will be downwards. Then also for this case, your right hand will be on the upper side and the left hand will be downwards. So he predicted that the deflection of this particular needle will be downwards according to this experiment that is the deflection of the needle should always be towards the left hand side of the swimmer so needle a will deflect downwards if the polarities of the battery are reversed or if the current was moving from this particular uh, terminal if the current was moving this way then needle a remember needle a the wire was passing above it huh? the wire was passing above needle a so the left hand will be downwards that is if you are swimming towards this direction then the right hand will be upwards so i expect needle a to deflect downwards then of course needle b will deflect in the opposite direction automatically needle b will deflect upwards needle b will deflect upwards so once again we said that uh, the ampere swimming rule states that if one imagines one is swimming along a wire in the direction of the current and facing the compass needle then the north pole of the needle will be deflected towards the swimmer's left hand next we look at uh, what we call the maxwell's screw rule we look at what we call the maxwell's screw rule so of course screw rule because the experiment itself is involving a screw so the maxwell screw rule states that if a right-handed screw is driven forward in the direction of the convectional current, then the direction of rotation of the screw is the direction of the field lines. Now, imagine that this is your screw, then you want to drive it forward. That is rotation of the screw. That is, you are rotating it in the direction shown by this particular arrow here. So, if you are rotating the screw or you are uh, driving the screw forward such that it is moving downwards then the direction of the rotation of the screw will be similar to the direction of the field lines that is what simply the maxwell screw rule is, stat is stating that if we are rotating this screw in this particular direction then we also expect uh, we expect the magnetic field lines to be uh, moving in a similar direction to that of the rotation of the screw so the maxwell's uh screw rule states that if a right-handed screw is driven forward in the direction of the convectional current then the direction of rotation of the screw is the direction of the field line so if we are rotating the screw in this direction then also the field lines uh, will be rotating in a similar direction to the direction of rotation of the screw so if we were rotating it maybe in this other direction, then we, we will expect the field lines to move in the opposite direction. But the most important thing here to note is that uh, the direction of the rotation, uh, of the forward rotation of the uh, screw line is also the direction of the rotation or the direction of motion of the field line. So and again, we've said that uh, the Maxwell screw rule states that if a right-handed screw is driven forward in the direction of the convectional current, then the direction of rotation of the screw is the direction of the rotation of the field line. So if the screw is rotating in, the, in this direction, this is the clockwise direction, then I also expect the field lines to rotate in the clockwise direction. So this is the direction of uh, motion of the current. So the current is downwards. This is a straight wire then direction of the magnetic 
thinned. The next we look at what we call the Fleming's right hand grip rule for a straight conductor carrying current. The Fleming's right hand grip rule for a conductor, uh, uh, for a straight conductor carrying current. Now, the Fleming's right hand grip rule for a conductor, for a straight conductor carrying current states that um, if a conductor carrying current is grasped in the right hand with the thumb pointing along the wire in the direction of the convectional current, comma, the fingers will point in the direction of the field magnetic field. So that is what the right hand grip rule actually for a straight conductor carrying current states. That if a conductor carrying current is grasped in the right hand with the thumb pointing along the wire in the direction of the convectional current, the fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field. Now, the, the first thing to note when you are using a right hand grip rule is that you should always use the, your right hand uh, when you are grasping your conductor. So, assuming this is my conductor, then assuming the direction is flowing in this, uh, the, the current is flowing in the forward direction, that is as indicated by this particular arrow, then the right hand grip rule is instructing us that if a conductor carrying current is grasped, that is to grasp is to hold it, uh, as you can see the, the right hand is holding this particular conductor, of course, with the current, that if a conductor carrying current is grasped in the right hand uh, with the thumb, remember this is the thumb, uh, with the thumb pointing along the wire in the direction of the convectional current. So if this is my direction of the current, then I will point uh, my thumb in the direction of the current. Then the right hand grip rule predicts that the fingers will point in the direction of magnetic field. So uh, if my thumb is pointing along the direction of the current, then this is my right hand. Then as you can see, my fingers are pointing in this direction. So the direction of, of curling of my fingers here represent the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, the magnetic field will be moving in this direction. They will be moving in this particular direction. That is along the direction of my fingers here. So the curling, the direction of curling of the fingers represents the direction of a uh, magnetic field. So once more, we've said that the Fleming's right hand grip rule for a straight conductor carrying current states that if a conductor carrying current is grasped in the right hand with the thumb pointing along the wire uh, pointing along the wire in the direction of the convectional current comma the fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field then you also remember it must be the the right hand uh, because if you try it the same same rule but using the left hand the direction will actually be opposite so you have to be careful uh. you must use the right hand now we can also demonstrate the same now indicating the direction of the magnetic or the direction of the magnetic field or the direction of the magnetic field lines remember the direction of the magnetic field will be same as the direction of magnetic field lines uh. because the magnetic field lines or the lines of force are the ones that form the magnetic field so the direction of the magnetic field line is automatically the direction of the magnetic field so if i apply the same same rule that if if this is my right hand uh, actually try with your right hand you realize that actually the rule does work just imagine you have a conductor for example you can just hold a nail uh, then assume that the direction of current of that of the current flowing through that particular nail is upward then you align your thumb remember the thumb is the uh, uh, uh the, the larger finger or the finger that is uh broader than the other actually the other fingers so this is my thumb so if i hold if i grasp or if i hold this conductor of mine such that my thumb is pointing along the direction of the current then the fingers you can see how the fingers are curling uh, or how they are yeah how they are grasping or how they are curling my conductor then that the fingers the direction of curling of the fingers 
is the direction of the magnetic field. So as you can see, my fingers are curling in this particular direction. Actually, this if I had a clock here, I think this would be the is it clockwise or anti clockwise i think this would be an anti-clockwise direction but the direction of curling of the fingers is the same as the direction of the magnetic field or the magnetic field line so that is simply what the right hand grip rule states so as a student you should be keen to know how to apply the right hand grip rule we also have the left hand grip rule which we will look at later on but the most important thing to remember is that when you are using the right hand grip rule Always remember to use the right hand. You use your right hand and not the left hand. So once more we've said that the right hand grip rule uh, for a straight conductor carrying current states that if a conductor carrying current is grasped in the right hand with the thumb pointing along the wire in the direction of the convection or current, comma, the fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field. So you just align your thumb along the direction of the current in a conductor then the curling or the grasping of your fingers the direction of the other fingers apart from the thumb simply represent the direction of the magnetic field so as you can see the fingers are curling in this direction also the direction of magnetic field is also this way that is as indicated by the arrow so the direction of magnetic field should be similar to the direction of curling of my fingers then uh, next we look at the right hand grip rule but for a loop carrying a current the right hand grip rule but for a loop carrying uh, a loop carrying a current so a loop a loop is just a circular just a uh, many magnetic field but maybe in a circular or you assume you have grasped them they are like in a originating from the same point of course but they are like in a loop or a circular a circular manner now the right hand grip rule for a loop carrying uh, a current states that if the fingers of the right hand encycle the current loop such that they point in the direction of of current comma the thumb points in the direction of the magnetic uh, field formed through the inside of the loop through the inside of the loop so actually the right hand grip rule is almost the same like for the straight conductor only that we are now using a loop a loop carrying a current so that if you just assume you are grasping huh? you are grasping actually these magnetic uh, field lines then of course you are your thumb has to point in the direction of the current like for this case this is current in huh? then this is current out so automatically this means that the current is moving in this particular direction that is it is entering through this end of the loop then it is moving in this direction then uh, actually it comes out uh, through this particular direction then the right hand grip rule for a loop carrying a current so states that if the fingers of the right hand now assuming this is my right hand actually it is my right hand if the fingers these are the fingers and this is the, the the thumb if the fingers that if the fingers of the right hand encycle the current loop so the current is actually moving in this direction but it is uh, somehow circular so you take your fingers to encycle to encycle is like to uh to to to, to take in a circular path uh, as you can see the current is actually moving in a circular path so you place your fingers in such a way that they are aligning with the direction of the current because the current is entering through here and leaving through the other end so if the current are entering through this direction i also curl or uh, make my fingers in such a way that they are encycling the current loop that if the fingers of the right hand encycle the current loop such that uh, they point in the direction of the current now remember this is the direction of the current this is current in then this is current out so the current is moving in this direction i also make my fingers in such a way that they are curling uh, or encycling and curling towards the direction of the current that if the fingers of the right hand encycle the current loop such that they point in the direction of the current then the thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field 
formed through the inside of the loop. Now, as you can see, when I'm encycling this particular uh, loop in the direction of the current, actually my thumb is pointing upwards. No, my thumb is pointing in this direction. That is uh, out of the paper. The thumb is pointing in this direction. So the direction of pointing of the thumb will represent the direction of motion of the what? Magnetic field or the magnetic field line. That's why you are seeing me indicating the arrow or the direction of the magnetic field lines to be actually in alignment with the direction of the thumb. So once more we've said that uh, the right hand grip rule for a loop carrying a current states that if the fingers of the right hand encycle the current loop such that they point in the direction of the current, comma, the thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field formed through the inside of the loop, through the inside of the loop. Now, we can also apply the same, same principle, but now for different, uh, for different, we look at uh, magnetic field patterns around current, current carrying conductors. Now, whenever you see this symbol, it actually means that the current is moving downwards. Huh? That is, the current is moving inside the paper. So, we assume the current is moving downwards. If it was in uh, three dimensions, I would be able to show you clearly. But it simply, uh, as you, it simply means that whenever you see an X, it means the direction is moving downwards or into the paper. Into, that is, downwards into my paper here, into the paper. Now, if the direction is moving downwards, now, you just take the same, same right hand, uh, then uh, you place your thumb. You place your thumb in such a way that the thumb could be moving. Now, remember here we want to determine, uh, we want to determine the direction of motion of the field line. So, we simply uh, align the thumb along the direction of the current. Now, because the current is into the paper, it means we will take our thumb, then we point the thumb downwards or into the paper. Now, try it practically. If you place your thumb, I'm also trying, uh, if you place the thumb of your right hand such a way, in such a way that the thumb is pointing downwards, you realize that the fingers are curling in this particular direction. The fingers, actually my fingers are also curling in this particular direction. That is, they are moving towards that direction. So try it practically. Just place your thumb downwards or into the paper. Then observe the direction of the curling of your fingers. So the direction of the curling of my fingers is actually this direction. So the fingers curl towards this direction. So the direction of the curling of the fingers represents the direction of the magnetic field. That is, we are just reversing uh, the law upward here, the right hand grip rule. So if you are given the, the direction of the current, you place your thumb towards the direction of the current, then identify the field. But if you are given the field, then they want you to identify the direction of the magnetic field. You just place your fingers towards the direction of the current. You curl them towards the direction of your current. Then the thumb will always point in the direction of the uh, magnetic field. And remember, the magnetic field uh, always, always originates from the North Pole. They originate from the... Uh, no, the magnetic field lines, yes, they originate from the North Pole and end at the South Pole. So if we were imagining to name maybe the polarities of the magnet, then automatically the North Pole will be towards this direction, then the South Pole will be towards the other direction. Because magnetic field lines will always originate from the North Pole towards the South Pole, as we saw in uh, a topic called uh, magnetism. Maybe if you can't trace it clearly, you can just review our first lesson on the topic magnetism then actually you will see that uh, at the field lines you look at the properties of the field line that is how they move and also how they do behave if i apply the same same here now whenever you see a dot this one means that the current is moving upwards or out of the paper out of the paper so in physics if we want to represent that the current is moving out of the paper we represent it with a dot but if we want to represent that the current is moving down the paper, that is downwards, we represent it with a cross. So whenever you see a cross in physics, it simply means the current is moving into the paper or downwards. But whenever you see a dot, that should imply that the current is moving what? 
upwards or outside the paper now for this case if the current is moving upward or outside the paper then it means we will have to align our thumb to be more pointing upwards now remember it is strictly the thumb of the right hand if you try the thumb of the left hand you will get opposite results so you take the thumb of your right hand then you position it upward huh? you just position it upward then observe the direction of curling of your fingers that is the first finger the second the third and of course the fourth finger so if you place your thumb pointing upwards you realize that your finger are actually curling in this particular direction i'm trying it practically here and it's working for me also try it practically and see whether actually when your thumb is pointing upwards your fingers are curling in this particular direction then of course drop a comment if uh, yours is working like mine then for this case this is current moving down huh? downwards so remember we said that a cross represents current moving downwards so, so for this case you will take your thumb pointing downwards so if i point my thumb downwards of the right hand actually my fingers are curling in this particular direction in this particular direction so the direction of curling of the finger represents the direction of magnetic field lines so also the same case here here the current is moving downwards if i place my thumb pointing downwards actually uh my fingers are curling in this direction so this represents the direction of the field lines same case here if my finger is pointing if my thumb is pointing downwards then my fingers that is you just take this thumb then you point it downwards or into the paper then observe observe the direction of in which these fingers are curling you realize that if i place my thumb here with the fingers uh, with my thumb pointing downwards that is downwards means towards the direction of the current then actually i realized that my fingers are curling in this direction so this direction represents the direction of the magnetic field also remember here because uh, we have attractive forces which means uh, then this is a neutral point then here we have repulsive forces huh? remember repulsion only takes place when there are two like poles together so that is to mean if you were to predict maybe the polarities maybe if this was an north pole this would also be a north pole so that they are repelling each other but if for this case if one is a north pole then the other one is a south pole that's why there is attraction between those particular two even you can see it from here actually here the fields are moving in this direction huh? but here the fields are moving in opposite direction meaning the polarity here if i was to place my polarities here this would be there would be uh, a north pole here because the magnetic field lines move from the north pole then a south pole here then here automatically there will be a south pole here and here a north pole because the magnetic field lines from move from the north pole towards the south pole now remember uh since we could be having a north pole here then a south pole here remember a north pole and a south pole will always attract each other also here if field lines are moving in this direction it means this one represents a north pole then field lines are moving towards huh? that is they are entering towards this region then this will represent a south pole then a north pole and a south pole will always attract each other that's why we have attractive forces here contrary here the direction is moving upwards also the direction of field lines is moving upwards huh? meaning the north pole is downward here then the south pole is upward here so this is a north pole then there will also be a north pole down here now north pole and north pole will always repel each other because from the law of magnetism we did say that uh like poles repel comma and like poles attract each other so because of the repulsion that's why we are talking of what repelling forces or repulsive forces next we look at uh, an electromagnet we look at an electromagnet now what is an electromagnet so an electromagnet is actually uh, a temporary magnet made by passing a direct current through a soft iron core so that is an electromagnet so if you are asked to define an electromagnet you simply say that an electromagnet is a temporary magnet made by passing a direct current through soft iron core remember direct current 
is denoted by DC. So whenever you pass uh, a direct current through uh, a magnetic material, and especially the soft ion, soft ion core because soft ion core can easily be magnetized and demagnetized. So because we want a material which can be magnetized faster, that's why we are using a soft ion core. So you simply uh, pass a direct current in a soft ion core, then you will obtain your uh, electromagnet. Then we are saying that an electromagnet is a temporary magnet. Huh? Temporary because soft ion core can easily lose its magnetism. That is, it can easily be magnetized and demagnetized. So the level of the magnetism is actually temporary. It is temporary. So an electromagnet is a temporary magnet made by passing a direct current through a soft ion core or simply a soft magnetic material. So we use soft ion core, soft ion ore is used because it is easily magnetized and easily demagnetized. Alternatively, you can just say we prefer using soft ion core and making an electromagnet because it is a soft magnetic material. So from magnetism, we did say that a soft magnetic material are those that are easily magnetized and demagnetized. Also, the soft ion core actually concentrates the magnetic field lines or the magnetic fields within the coil. So you can be asked to give two reasons why we prefer using soft ion ore when making electromagnets. So the first reason is because a soft ion core or ore is a, a soft magnetic material. Or you can say uh, we prefer using soft ion ore because it can easily be magnetized and demagnetized. But our main point here is the magnetization. It is easily magnetized. Then we are also saying the other reason is because the soft ion core or ore concentrates the magnetic lines of force or the magnetic field within uh, the coil. So remember when the magnetic field lines are concentrated, it means the magnetic field is actually stronger. It will be stronger. Then whenever we want to predict uh, uh, the North Pole of the electromagnet, we can easily use what we call the right hand grip rule. So the right hand grip rule can be used to predict the north pole of an electromagnet so we use the right hand grip rule to predict the north pole of an electromagnet as uh, we will see in our next experiment so we conduct an experiment that can be used to show us how we make an electromagnet so this is an experiment to investigate how the size of current flowing in the solenoid affects the strength of an electromagnet so in this experiment, the apparatus required are, one, we need a long insulated copper wire, a long insulated copper wire. Then we also need a rheostat. This is our, our rheostat or the variable resistor. We also need a power source. We need our power source here, like you have our battery here. Then we also need uh, maybe so our source can be our power source can be a lead acid accumulator, preferably maybe of six volts. Huh? Then of course we also need a switch that is for opening and closing the circuit. Then we also need a dish containing paper pins. Huh? So this is our dish, then it is containing the steel pins. Then of course we also need an iron rod. So this is our iron core or what we are calling the iron rod. Then after that, the procedure that we will use to set up or to carry out the experiment is that one, you do, you wind 20, around 20 tons of insulated copper wire tightly around the iron rod. So this is what we are calling our copper wire. Of course, it is insulated. Huh? So you insulate it, meaning it's actually a cable or it has some uh, insulator or plastic material which is uh, covering it. So you wind, you wind around 20 tons of insulated copper wire tightly around the iron rod. So this is our iron rod. You simply encycle or you wind, you wind uh, our copper wire around our soft iron core. Then after that, connect it to the battery as shown here. So after winding it, of course, we connect it to the battery. This is our battery here. After that, you switch on the current and adjust the variable resistor or the real start to give a current of maybe around 0 0.5 so after 
connecting, we close the switch, then we vary our rheostat. Remember the rheostat will determine the amount of current uh, passing through the circuit. So maybe we set a small current of maybe around 0.5 amperes, then uh, we look at the observation. We observe what happens to the steel pins. Then we also repeat the same same experiment but increasing the amount of current. Of course the rheostat will help us to increase the amount of current. Maybe we increase it to 1.5 amperes, maybe next to 2 amperes, maybe next to 2.5 amperes. Then we observe what happens to the steel pins. Now in this particular experiment it is observed that actually as you increase the current the steel pins get attracted to this particular ion core. The steel pins get attracted to this particular ion core. Showing that actually the ion core is magnetized. Remember we did look at how to magnetize a magnetic material by electrical method. It is actually the same same process or the same same procedure. So you remember that we also have to use a direct current or a DC current. When you close the circuit then uh, uh, you adjust the current maybe to 0.5 amperes it is observed that the steel pins, some of the steel pins will actually be attracted to the soft iron core. So maybe assuming when the current is 0.5, maybe two pins get attracted. When the current is increased maybe to 1.5, maybe five pins will get attracted or will get hooked here. Then if we increase the current to a maximum value, maybe 2.5 or even 3 amperes, it is observed that more steel pins will be attracted to the magnet actually showing that uh, the strength uh, uh, the more the current supplied the more the level of the magnetization of the soft iron core therefore the more the attraction of the steel pins so as the current is increased uh, as the current is increased the mass of the pin supported that is representing the strength of the magnet as the current is increased more pins or more pins will get attracted to the a soft iron core. Why? Because whenever a current, a direct current is passed through a solenoid uh, which is wind or which is winding, uh, which is wound on an iron, a soft iron core, actually the soft iron core gets magnetized or it acquires magnetism. When it acquires magnetism, it means now it has the ability to attract any magnetic material. So it has the ability to attract steel pins which are actually magnetic material. Now remember in this experiment we are using steel pins strictly because steel pins uh, we categorized steel under the hard magnetic material. That is they take a lot of time to be magnetized but once they are magnetized they retain their magnetism. So if you take a steel pin once it is held here it actually retains the magnetism for some time. So it clings here for some time. But of course when, whenever you uh, open the circuit, uh, the current disconnects then after th sometimes the steel pins will actually fall off. So as the current is increased, the mass of the pins supported into bracket that is representing the strength of the magnet increases. So beyond a particular value, however, the strength of the electromagnet remains what? Constant. So you can supply the current, you supply the current up to a maximum value. So the, the magnetism of the soft iron core gets to a maximum value. Remember in the domain theory, what we used to call the magnetic saturation. Huh? So it reaches at a point whereby even if you uh, continue increasing the current, actually the magnetism will not increase because such a material has reached what we call magnetic saturation. So as the current is increased, it is observed that the mass of the pin supported which are representing the strength of the magnet also increases. So as the current increases, more pins get clinked here or attached here because as the current is increasing, the soft iron core is becoming more magnetized. It's becoming more magnetized. Remember, if we were to plot a current, uh, a graph of uh, maybe the strength of the magnet and the amount of current, then the strength of the magnet will be directly proportional to the amount of current, meaning we will obtain a straight line graph through the origin, through the origin. So of course representing the direct proportionality. So as the strength of the current increases, also the strength of the magnet increases. But that graph will reach at a point where it flattens. Huh? That is where the soft iron core has reached what we call magnetic saturation. 
So remember, if a material reaches that magnetic saturation, even if you continue supplying the current, the current will not increase the magnetism. The current won't increase the magnetism because all the dipoles have fully aligned. So next, we look at uh, the factors affecting the strength of an electromagnet. What are the factors affecting the strength of an electromagnet? So the first factor affecting the strength of an electromagnet is the number of turns of the coil. That is, uh, this is my coil. Huh? The number of turns of these particular coils are affects the strength of the electromagnet. That is, determines how strong the electromagnet will actually be magnetized. So, of course, the more the number of turns of coil, the stronger the electromagnet. So, if you want, if you want your electromagnet to be stronger, you actually use more turns. Huh? So, that, is, that means you use a larger or a longer copper wire, then you wind it. You make as many turns as possible because the more the number of turns, the more the strength of the electromagnet. So, the first factor affecting strength of an electromagnet is the number of turns of the coil the number of turns of the coil then you are saying that uh, the strength of an electromagnet is directly proportional to the number of turns of coil that is to mean the more the coils the stronger the uh, electromagnet the fewer the number of turns of the coil the fewer the strength of the electromagnet the second factor affecting the strength of the electromagnet is simply what we call the uh, current flowing in the coils that is the amount of current flowing through the coils so as we saw actually the more the current the more the pin the steel pins will be attached meaning the more the current the more the strength of the of the electromagnet the more the attraction of the pins so the current flowing in the coils is our second factor affecting the strength of the electromagnet so of course the higher the current flowing the higher the current flowing through the coils, the stronger the electromagnet. So we are also saying that the amount of current flowing through the uh, coil is directly proportional to the strength of the electromagnet. So the more the current, the more the stronger the electromagnet or the more the strength of the electromagnet. The lesser the current, the lesser uh, the strength of the electromagnet. The third factor is the shape of the core. Like for this case, we are using a straight core. Sometimes we also have what we call uh, a U-shaped uh, or a circular core. Now, whenever we use a circular core, the strength of the, mag of the electromagnet will be more than when you use a straight core. So we look at the reasons behind that. So the third factor we are saying that the shape of the core. Then under that, we are saying that a U-shaped core makes stronger electromagnet than a straight core. Like you remember the same same reason when we are looking at the horseshoe magnet. Huh? We did say that the horseshoe magnet will always be have stronger magnetic fields than the straight magnet. And the reason is because a U-shaped core brings the poles closer together. Hence, the lines of force get more concentrated. They get more concentrated. Remember a horseshoe or a U-shaped uh, magnet means it will be like uh, in this shape, uh, that is the U-shaped, uh, but we adjust this one to be closer to the other one. So a, a U-shaped magnet actually brings the polarities together, that is the North Pole and the, close, and the South Pole becomes closer to each other. And closer they are, it means the stronger the magnetic fields, uh, because they are concentrated together. So if you are asked to give a reason why a U-shaped uh, core makes a stronger electromagnet, than a straight core is the reason is because a U-shaped core brings the poles of the uh, brings the poles closer together and hence the lines of force get concentrated. But a straight a straight uh, core actually you can see the 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 the, the, the north pole is down here and the south pole is up there. The further the poles are the weaker the strength of the electromagnet or the weaker the magnetic field. But the closer the poles, the stronger the magnetic field. Now, we also did say that we can determine the direction of the uh, electromagnet, of course, using the right-hand grip rule. Like for this case, uh, I have my current. The current is flowing in this particular direction. The current, this is, uh, we did say that the larger bar represents the positive terminal. So the current is flowing in this particular direction direction the current is flowing this way this way this way then it gets out up to the negative 
terminal. So remember, if you are using the right hand grip rule, you simply curl your fingers in the direction of the current of the core. So if the current is coming from the positive terminal, then the current is moving actually this way. Remember, this one is passing uh, upwards, uh, but on the other side, it's passing downwards. So if this one is passing upwards, you also align your fingers uh, of the right hand in the direction of curling of this particular uh, coil or what we are calling a solenoid. So if I curl my fingers, the fingers of my right hand, you also try, try curling your fingers in this particular direction. That is, your fingers should be pointing from upwards, downwards. Huh? They should be pointing downwards in the direction of the curling of the coil. Then you realize actually your thumb will be pointing downwards. So the thumb is pointing downwards. So remember the downwards, the thumb always points in the direction of the north pole. The thumb will always point in the direction of the north pole. That's why you are saying that this is a north pole and this is a south pole. Remember in an exam situation, they usually, they don't tell you that you use the right hand grip rule. They just uh, give you the apparatus, then they ask you to state the direction of, maybe they can name this one X and this one Y. Then they tell you to indicate or to state the direction of X and the, no, the polarity of X and the polarity of Y. So we, here we use the right hand grip rule. You just take your fingers, then you curl them towards the direction of the current then of course the direction in which the, the the thumb will point will be the direction of the north pole now if the polarities were reversed assuming this was the positive terminal and this would be the negative terminal then it means the current will be moving in this direction so if the current was moving in this direction it means when you are curling your finger you put your fingers downwards then they emerge from the other side now, if the fingers are curling, you take your fingers through downwards, then they emerge upwards. If your fingers are curling downwards, then emerging from upwards, you realize that you are, your thumb will be pointing upwards. So, the upper direction will be the north pole, then the lower direction will be the south pole. But based on the diagram, according to the direction of the current here, the north pole will be downwards because if I curl my finger of the right hand, the thumb points downwards and therefore... Uh, the North Pole becomes the down direction. Then the fourth and last factor affecting the strength of an electromagnet is the length of the solenoid. Then here we are saying that the longer the solenoid, the weaker the electromagnet. That uh, uh, the longer the solenoid, the weaker the electromagnet. So the solenoid, the solenoid is just the curling. If you take a wire and curl it, uh, such that it is maybe somehow like in a, a circular, a circular shape, then that is what we are calling a solenoid. So like this one here is actually our solenoid. So the length of the solenoid, that is the distance from where the solenoid is ending or where the curling of the wire is ending, this distance, from here up to down here, or the distance from here up to upper here, that the longer this distance is, the weaker the strength of the electromagnet. So remember, if you want your magnet, electromagnet to be stronger, you bring this, uh, the curling of this particular wire, the copper wire, you bring them, them close together. If they are closer together, it means the length of the solenoid is actually shorter. So the shorter the length of the solenoid, the stronger the magnetic field or the stronger uh, the electromagnet. But if the length of the solenoid, that is the distance of the curling that is the distance from here of this particular wire up to here the longer that distance is the weaker the strength of the magnet then uh, uh, the shorter the shorter that particular length of the solenoid is actually the stronger the electromagnet so we have said in summary we have said that the four factors the four factors affecting uh, the strength of the electromagnet are one the number of turns of coil the explanation is that the more the number of turns of the coil, the stronger the electromagnet. Then two, we have talked of the current, the amount of current flowing in the coils. Then we have said that under that, the higher the current flowing through the coils, the stronger the electromagnet. The third factor was shape of the core. Then we've said that uh, a U-shaped core makes stronger electromagnet than a straight core. Then the reason we have given is because a U-shaped core brings the poles closer together hence the lines of force get concentrated then the last factor was then the length of the 
solenoid then we have said that the longer the solenoid actually the weaker the electromagnet the weaker the electromagnet then lastly we look at what we call force on a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field the force uh, on a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field to predict that force we use what we call the Fleming's left hand rule also called the motor rule so the motor rule or the Fleming's left hand rule states that if the left hand is held with the thumb comma the first finger and the second fingers mutually at right angles so that the first finger points in the direction of the magnetic field and the second finger in the direction of the current comma then the thumb points in the direction of motion uh, so uh, remember in the Fleming's left hand rule we strictly use the left hand we use the left hand remember in the right hand grip rule we were strictly using the right hand but if you are dealing with the uh, motors the left hand uh, uh, the left hand rule here we use the left hand so this particular rule is saying that if the left hand is held with the thumb that is you hold your hand in such a way that the thumb is perpendicular to the first finger and also perpendicular to the second finger you hold your hand in this particular manner thumb pointing upwards first finger in this direction then the second finger obviously in a normal situation it will be pointing towards this particular direction so you hold them perpendicular perpendicular because if you try to estimate the angle between this particular that is this particular the thumb and the first finger and also the second finger this angle should be 90 that is what we mean by perpendicular or mutually at right angles right angle remember means uh, 90 degrees huh? So if the left hand is held with the thumb, comma, the first finger and the second finger mutually at right angles so that the first finger points in the direction of the magnetic field. So you take your first finger pointing in the direction of the magnetic field, then actually uh, the second finger will point in the direction of the current. You take your second finger in the direction of the current, then the thumb will always point in the direction of motion. So if I apply this particular rule here, then if this is my north pole, then this is my south pole. Then another point you need to notice that whenever you are given a magnet, the north pole represents the origin of the magnetic field. Then the south pole represents the end of the magnetic field. So magnetic field lines will always originate from the north pole and end at the south pole. So the, this is the direction of the magnetic field lines. So you take your first finger to point in the direction of the magnetic field lines then you take your second finger to point in the direction of the current if this is my current remember this is an arrow indicating that the, the current is moving downwards so you align your second finger in the direction of the current then you realize that actually the thumb the thumb will be pointing upwards or in the direction of the motion so an easier way of remembering this is that the first finger we have f here represent F and F. Huh? So as you can see, first finger fields huh? represent the field. So you can take F and F to remember that always the first finger represents the field. Then the second finger, we have the current. Huh? We have C here. We also have C here. So C and C. So you just remember that because the second has C somewhere, then that would represent the current. So we have C and C here represent the current. Then of course the thumb, we have M here. We all, then this one is starting with motion so m represents the motion and the other thing to remember is that it must strictly be the left hand it must be the left hand because if you apply the same with the right hand you'll actually obtain opposite uh, results opposite results so you just align you take your hand then the first finger you align it towards the direction of the field so the field we've said they move from the north pole towards the south pole then the second finger you align it uh, along the direction of the conductor but toward the direction of the current then observe the direction of motion of the, of the thumb where the thumb because for my case the thumb is pointing upwards then i expect this particular conductor to move upwards the direction of the deflection of the conductor will be upwards then another point that i see students actually confusing is when to use the left hand uh, the left hand rule the Fleming's left hand rule and when to use the Fleming's right hand rule 
Now, remember this. The left hand rule or also called the motor rule is strictly used when we are dealing with uh, electric motors. When we are using with electric motors. So remember an electric motor will always uh, convert an electric motor will always convert electrical energy into mechanical energy. Remember mechanical energy is categorized into potential energy and kinetic energy and kinetic energy. An example where an electric motor is applied is um, in the working in the working of the fan. Huh? That is the fan that is used in uh, houses or supermarkets or in shopping malls to reduce the temperature of the room or to cool the room or sometimes to increase also the temperature of the room. So those fans, huh? those fans, they convert electrical energy into kinetic energy. So a material or a device that converts electrical energy into mechanical energy is what we are calling an electric motor. So when we are dealing with electric motors, we strictly use the Fleming's left hand rule to predict the direction of motion of that particular conductor or sometimes the field and even the, the current. But when you are using an electric generator, remember an electric generator will always do the reverse of an electric motor. We've said that an electric motor will convert electrical energy into a uh, mechanical energy. And we've said mechanical energy, uh, we can talk of kinetic and potential energy. So essentially we are saying that a motor will convert electrical energy into kinetic energy or into chemical uh, mechanical energy but a generator an electrical generator will strictly convert now the mechanical energy into electrical energy please do not confuse between these two i'm saying that an electric motor will convert uh, uh, electrical energy into kinetic energy an example we have given a fan if you see a fan rotating it will only rotate if you are connected it to electricity and the electricity is what we are calling the electrical energy. So the fan, the motor within the fan converts the electrical energy into kinetic energy, which is a mechanical energy. So whenever you are dealing with an electric motor, use Fleming's left hand rule. But whenever you are using an electric generator, and you are saying that an electric generator will do the reverse of an electric motor, an electric generator converts mechanical energy energy into uh, electrical energy an example of mechanical energy is the kinetic energy so for example you are saying that an electrical generator can convert kinetic energy that is energy in motion into electrical energy a good example of an electrical generator is the bicycle dynamo the bicycle dynamo will only work if the wheel of the of the bicycle is actually rotating because when the wheel of the bicycle rotates it also rotates either the magnet or the contactor in between. Therefore, it converts the kinetic energy or the mechanical energy into electrical energy. For example, the electric motor can be used to the electrical generator or the bicycle dynamo can be used to light maybe the bulb of that particular bicycle. So a device that converts uh, a mechanical energy or kinetic energy into electrical energy is called an electrical generator and whenever you are dealing with an electrical generator strictly use Fleming's right hand rule use Fleming's right hand rule and you have given examples so kindly don't confuse between the two electrical uh, electrical motor converts uh, electrical energy into kinetic energy then if you are using an electrical motor strictly use the Fleming's left hand rule but an electrical generator converts a uh, kinetic energy or mechanical energy into electrical energy then if you are using an electrical generator we strictly use the Fleming's right hand rule uh, so I think we've come to the end of our class today but we need to discuss the quote of the day the quote of the day stated that life is like riding a bicycle such that for you to stay balanced you must keep moving now what does this particular quote mean 
The quote is warning us against feeling complacent or contented with what we have already achieved in our lives. Rather, uh, the quote is encouraging us to always stay hungry and motivated for the next opportunity that comes in our life. And always remember that whenever you attain a certain level in your life, there is always the next level and that should be your motivation. And also be careful not to waste your, uh, your future opportunities for a temporary comfort. And lastly, never ever stop learning because life never ever stops teaching. So that is the end of our class today. Uh, now, dear my viewers, I know that it's been long since I posted a video, but you've always been supporting me and I don't take that for granted. I've seen several comments of people wanting me to produce uh, more videos and because of your support, I've seen it important to continue producing more videos and uh, I promise to keep even uh, producing very many videos and quality videos. But I'll also beg you to hit the subscription button and also to turn on the notification bell so that whenever I upload a new video, you will actually be the first person to uh, get a notification. Actually, I'm very happy and very excited to be back and uh, let's keep this going. We are here to change lives. We are here to help students. Uh, if there is a concept that maybe you've not understood well, just drop a comment uh, in the comment section of this video and I'm actually going to help where uh, necessary. Thank you. Let's meet in our next class. This is Kind Tuition Academy.